the ability to look into people's genetics makeup is fantastically larger, quicker and cheaper than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. I think we have the real potential to turn some of these discoveries into new treatments for patients. If you develop lung cancer now, obviously that is a terrible diagnosis to have, but your life expectancy is probably 10 times greater than it would have been in the 1960s if you developed lung cancer. So there have been huge strides forward in terms of treatment for lung cancer, which I think in Parkinson's disease and in brain diseases in general, we have not matched the discoveries and the advances of our friends in, in cancer research. There are a few different reasons for that, and, and um, they, um, I think, help to frame thinking about research in Parkinson's and the type of research we should do. First of all, diagnosis in cancer is a lot easier than diagnosis in Parkinson's disease. So if you develop a cancer, it's possible to take a tissue sample and to analyse that sample under the microscope and to make a definite diagnosis. In Parkinson's disease, we can't do that. We're dependent on um, clinical diagnosis and we're in the process, uh, funded by Parkinson's UK and other organisations, of developing new biomarkers, new ways of making the diagnosis more accurate, earlier, and perhaps comparable with the type of diagnosis in cancer. The second thing is that um, within, um, within cancer, it's very easy to see how extensive the disease is. So if you have a lung cancer, you can do a CT scan of the chest, see uh, the size of a tumour, you can give the treatment, you can watch the tumour shrink down and immediately see that you've had an effect on the disease. In Parkinson's at the moment, we don't have markers that can, that can indicate that. We don't have a marker that can show us within a few months whether we've fundamentally impacted the disease process. I don't think we understand mechanisms in Parkinson's as well as we do in cancer. In cancer, we know the problem is cell division and that if you stop cells dividing in an unregulated way, then you can treat the disease. In Parkinson's, I think, certainly up until the last 10 years, our understanding of the basic processes is, uh, is much less well developed than it is in cancer. And I think this is an area where genetics has got a huge role to play in terms of telling us the basic processes. And one of the other fundamental differences is the amount of funding that there is for cancer research. So in terms of the cost to the nation of neurological diseases, they uh, are uh, about at least five times greater than the cost to the nation of, of cancer. And yet the amount of funding that goes into cancer research is about 10 times greater than the amount of funding that goes into brain research. So we've got a long way to catch up within brain research to catch up the amount of funding that there is going into cancer research. So these are some of the challenges that we've got, I think, as a community in terms of taking forward new um, treatments and new knowledge for, uh, for Parkinson's. The other thing I would say is how important I think research is. So Parkinson's UK do a fantastic job in um, developing information for patients, local support groups, care, but a very, um, a very important wish of many, if not all patients with Parkinson's, is that, new, that we'll understand more about the disease, we'll take forward research, and we'll develop new treatments. And, and the research that we're undertaking is really a contract between ourselves, the researchers, the Parkinson's community, uh, people affected by Parkinson's, their families, their loved ones, to try to take forward our understanding of the disease and to take us forward towards new treatments. So that's really an important contract and mission that we have as researchers. So on to, on to genetics. First of all, uh, what is a gene? Well, we all, we all have about 20,000 genes uh, in every cell in the body. So the genes are the instructions that contain the uh, messages to make all of the proteins in the body. And the, the gene expression in different cells in the body make uh, the different types of cells in the body, so the difference between hair cells, brain cells, heart cells, is conferred by the genes that are expressed in those cells. Um, obviously, the genes that we, uh, that we carry uh, make us humans as opposed to other um, species. And genes, effectively, and the proteins they make, control all of the biological processes in the cell, including the biological processes that determine whether someone develops a disease and what the type of disease is and what goes wrong with the cell when a disease develops. So um, the uh, chemical component of genes is DNA. So DNA is the um, chemical uh, makeup of genes. So a string of letters 
that contains the genetic code that makes uh, amino acids, so the building blocks of proteins within cells. So that's the fundamental um, thing that we are uh, studying, the, um, uh, the genetic makeup of people. And obviously, what we're particularly interested in is the genetic makeup of people with Parkinson's as compared with people who don't have Parkinson's. We all carry about, um, as I said, 20,000 genes. We have two copies of each gene, one from our mum, one from our dad. And uh, we can now very rapidly um, study people's whole genetic makeup uh, uh, extremely efficiently and extremely cost effectively. So the, um, the cost, so the length of the human genome is about 3 billion base pairs. So there are 3 billion letters that make up the, uh, the, whole of the, the whole of the genome. The cost of the Human Genome Project, when the human genome was first sequenced, and those 3 billion letters were spelled out, and for the first time we knew what it was to be human on a chemical basis, we knew what people's genetic makeup was, and all of the, the sequence of all of the genes of the body. The cost of that, um, the cost of that program was about $3 billion. So about $1 for each of the bases, for each of the letters that are in the genetic code. Today, we can, um, we can take blood samples from people sitting here in the auditorium. We can extract DNA, the genetic makeup from those blood samples, and it will cost us between $1,000 and $2,000 to determine someone's entire genetic makeup, their entire genome. So the, the, um, the speed, efficiency, and cost of determining someone's genetic makeup has dramatically uh, um, decreased in terms of both the cost and the speed. And that really represents a huge opportunity for us as biologists and medical scientists in terms of understanding what's going on with, with almost all um, human diseases. So we talk, about, um, we talk about studying genes. In fact, we're not really studying genes. Genes are not our main interest. What we're really interested in is variation between genes, so how people's genes differ. So again, if I were to, um, at the end of this talk, if I was to take a blood sample from everyone in the audience, take that back to the lab, sequence everyone here's genetic makeup, and then start to compare the genetic makeup for people in the audience, about every 1,000 letters through the genetic code, I'd see a difference. So not everyone here in the audience will have exactly the same genetic code. There will be differences between people. And about every 1,000 letters along the code, we will see a variation, a difference. The question is, what does this variation mean? Well, in fact, most of the variation in the genetic code has no biological effect at all. So as far as we know, a lot of the variation in the genetic code has no functional um, difference. There are variants within people's genetic makeup that uh, relate to normal variation between people. So it's common experience that height, sporting ability, uh, hair colour, eye colour, these are things that run in families. And these are things that are conferred by genetic differences between people. So people's normal genetic variation confers normal difference between people. There are some variants within the genetic code that slightly increase your risk of developing disease, perhaps with other genetic or environmental factors. So we know that if you carry a genetic variant that affects the way that you metabolize cholesterol, then that in itself doesn't lead to a heart attack or a stroke. But if you carry that genetic variant and you also take a high-fat diet or you're a smoker, then these things together, these genetic risk factors together with other factors, will lead on to a disease like stroke or heart disease. A much rarer uh, situation is when there is a genetic variant which greatly increase, increases your risk of developing disease, so which substantially increases your risk of developing disease, such as the disease itself seems to run in the family. So one of the best um, known examples of this within uh, neurological disease is Huntington's disease. So we know that people who are affected by Huntington's disease carry a faulty copy of the Huntington's gene. And you need to have one copy of that gene to develop the disease. When we have children, when we, when we make sperm and eggs, we only pass on one copy of the gene. And that means that each of our children would have a one in two risk of inheriting the disease gene. So that would be a disease that would um, run through the family. The other thing perhaps I should say at this point is that all of us carry many, many variations with our genome. So all of us carry lots of variations that affect natural, our natural characteristics, but also our risk of developing disease. So all of us carry these variants, and we're just at the beginning of understanding how analysing these variants can improve treatments for patients 
and can improve our health delivery and people's quality of life. And that obviously is our um, aim um, within this research. I'm just going to say a little bit about Parkinson's risk. So this um, slide, and I'd very much uh, like to thank uh, Claire Bale and Parker UK for helping with developing these slides for the talk. And this was a um, slide that's developed to really talk about the risk in Parkinson's disease to other family members of developing Parkinson's disease. So one of the really important points that I'd like to stress is that for the vast majority of Parkinson's patients, there is an ex extremely low risk of other um, members of the family being affected by Parkinson's. So in general terms, Parkinson's is not a disease that runs in the family. So for the vast majority of people, there is no increased or no significant increased risk to other family members. Occasionally, and that's represented by this very pale blue, um, this very, whoops, this very pale blue um, uh, uh, group of people with Parkinson's in whom there's no risk to other family members. Very occasionally, we come across families where the disease is running within the family. So part of the many, many people in the family have been affected by Parkinson's. Perhaps 10 people have been affected by Parkinson's. And so we think in that situation that that family is one of the very rare families in which there's a single genetic factor that has a strong effect on developing disease. And these families are extremely rare, but they can give us tremendous insights into how the disease starts. So if you've been affected by Parkinson's, perhaps the first thing that you think of after you know, processing the diagnosis is, why has this affected me? Is it because I had a head injury or was in a car crash or I lived next to a factory or, or was there some environmental factor? Why has this affected me? Most of the time, we can't really answer that question. But actually, in this case, in these families where it's run in the family, we can actually go to the lab and identify with some certainty what the cause of disease in that family is. And obviously, that's extremely powerful in terms of understanding the disease and getting the first clue which will allow us to develop new treatments. We also know that there are people in whom we think there may well be a genetic fact that's relevant, perhaps 2 or 3% of people with Parkinson's, but so far we've not identified the relevant genetic variant. So there are a pool of people that we're very interested to make contact with, that I'll talk a little bit about later on in the talk, in whom, um, because they have a strong family history and we can't yet identify the variant, or perhaps because they develop Parkinson's very early in life, that there may be a genetic factor that we haven't yet identified that may explain why they develop Parkinson's. So we have a lot more work to do in terms of understanding um, uh, genetic factors. So um, Parkinson's is a disease where the average age of onset is in the 60s. If you're someone who's developed Parkinson's in your 20s, that's a very unusual thing to happen. And we're particularly interested in why that might have happened. In fact, this is the research that I've developed with Parkinson's UK research dating back about 12 years. They initially funded me to start a study where we, in Cardiff, we started to recruit and make contact with people with early onset and young onset Parkinson's, collect DNA samples, ask them about their environmental exposures to start trying to unpick why people might develop Parkinson's at a very early age of onset. Again, usually, in, actually, in that group, there's not risk to parents or children of developing Parkinson's, but there may be genetic factors that are strong within those individuals that may help us develop new treatments. Uh, thanks very much. Is Parkinson's inherited? Uh, unfortunately, as with most things in science, there isn't a simple answer. But the bottom line is that for most people, no. This man lived to be 90. He did not have Parkinson's disease, but his two uh, brothers had Parkinson's disease, and he traced the family back 